Welcome to another Foldit Lab Report. I am BKEP here at the Institute for Protein Design in Seattle. If this is your first time tuning into a Foldit Lab Report, we produce these videos on the first of every month to tell you more about the science behind Foldit. This week, we're doing something a little different. We're going to put the lab back in Lab Report and take you behind the scenes here at the Institute for Protein Design. Have you ever wondered what happens after a Foldit puzzle closes? After the Foldit scientists have looked at all of your solutions and picked out the ones to test in the lab, well, what does that testing actually look like? You can think of a protein design in Foldit as more of a digital hypothesis about how this amino acid sequence will fold. There's no actual guarantee that your amino acid sequence will fold into the structure that you designed. That's something that we need to test in the lab. So when it comes to studying a protein in the lab, the essential information to test is that protein's amino acid sequence. So where do we typically find amino acid sequences? Well, they're normally encoded in DNA. In the lab, we use custom DNA to study the proteins that you design and fold it. With custom DNA, we can ensure that we test exactly the amino acid sequence that you put on your design. Today, specialized companies will manufacture whatever DNA you want using technology that is actually pretty similar to an inkjet printer. We just tell them what DNA sequence we want to have, and in a matter of days, they ship us actual DNA molecules with our custom sequence. The DNA arrives in the mail just like anything else you buy online. The amount we actually receive in an envelope is less than a millionth of a gram. It's so small, you can't even see it. The DNA arrives all on its own in an empty tube. So the first step is to add a tiny drop of salt water for the DNA molecules to dissolve into. This just makes it easier for us to measure and transfer the DNA in liquid form. So now we have in our hands a tube with DNA molecules that encode a protein design made by a folded player. But there's no protein in here. How do we get from the DNA to a protein? Or more specifically, how do we get from the DNA to its amino acid sequence? By far, the cheapest and easiest way is to let biology do it. We use living cells to make your proteins. Since all life on Earth uses the same genetic code and the same basic strategies for making proteins, we can just pop a new DNA molecule into a cell and it will know what to do. The cells we use, bacteria and yeast, don't know the difference between their own DNA and the DNA that was made in the lab. To physically put the new DNA molecules into the living cells, we simply mix the DNA in the cells in a test tube. Then we use heat, or sometimes electricity, to shock the cells in a way that temporarily causes them to absorb the DNA from their surroundings. Now we'll plate the cells on a petri dish that contains a nutrient-rich agar, which is kind of like a starchy jello made from seaweed. The cells love it and will begin to grow. We skipped over this before, but in our custom DNA, we included a gene for antibiotic resistance, right alongside the gene encoding our protein design. By adding a little bit of antibiotic to our Petri dish, we ensure that only cells that absorbed our custom DNA will be able to grow there. After a few hours, we can see tiny spots of bacterial growth have appeared in our Petri dish. Each spot is actually millions of individual bacterial cells, called a colony growing on the agar. Now that we have a population of healthy bacteria that contain our custom DNA, we are ready to finally start making some protein. We scoop up a single colony and drop it into a flask full of liquid nutrients, things like sugar, a nitrogen source, and all the other chemicals you need to start building proteins. An incubator keeps the flask at a toasty 37 degrees Celsius and constant shaking helps the bacteria get oxygen from the air. These little bacteria will grow and divide like crazy, doubling the number of cells in the flask every 20 minutes. All the while, they will synthesize billions and billions of protein molecules. In a future video, we'll pick up here and show how we extract this protein from the bacteria and purify it so that we can study it more in the lab. And that brings us to this month's design of the month. This month, I want to focus on a symmetric design from puzzle 2159. This is a symmetric tetramer designed by S.P. Vincent. 
Now, you know I like to look at these in the protein design default view uh, because I like to see all of the red oxygens and the blue nitrogens that need to make hydrogen bonds. And we see right off the bat, this is a nice uh, mixed alpha beta fold. So there is a strong alpha helix here with four beta strands packed into a nice beta sheet um, in each of these monomer units. And there are four of them here. We see that this beta sheet has a nice uh, healthy twist. If you look down the end of it, um, beta sheets naturally like to twist like this. So uh, these beta sheets look like um, a realistic fold. We see lots of orange hydrophobics in the core of the monomer and lots of blue hydrophilic residues on the surface. And then here at the interface between monomer units, we see that there is a combination of good hydrophobic packing, lots of orange residues packing on other orange residues, and then also some nice hydrogen bonding between blue polar residues. And it's important that these blue polar residues here are somewhat buried. They're in the core. Um, polar residues that are on the surface can make hydrogen bonds with water. And so the hydrogen bond networks, um, they're not obligatory. They can form or they could not, but the protein will be soluble either way. When a blue polar side chain is buried at the interface in such a way that it makes hydrogen bonds, um, then that confers some specificity to the protein because it would it would mean that the protein could not form off-target states without creating bonds. So we do see that there is a very nice hydrogen bond network here with some buried blue polar residues. Um, this hydrogen bond network does have uh, this red hydrogen bond here, um, and that just indicates that this is a, a weaker hydrogen bond. Um, we can see the geometry here is not, not ideal for a hydrogen bond. Normally, we like to see that the hydrogens are pointed directly at the acceptor and that the, the blue-white candy cane spirals that we see um, should come right down the axis where that hydrogen is pointing. So anyway, this, this red hydrogen bond is not the strongest. It may or may not form, um, but all in all, that might be okay. Um, this serine here is well positioned to either donate a hydrogen bond here or it could accept one from this nitrogen. Aside from that, I do like to see the nice balance of hydrophobic residues at the interface and hydrophilics. Remember, the hydrophobics are important for tight binding. Since hydrophobics like to be buried from solvent, they will often make tight binding interactions. Um, and these proteins will naturally want to come together so that these orange hydrophobics are hidden. The one thing that might worry me a little bit about this is I see that this one strand in particular here is made up entirely of orange hydrophobic residues. So that's eight hydrophobic residues in a row. And when you have lots of hydrophobic residues in a row, especially a single uh, secondary structure unit like a sheet or a helix that is entirely hydrophobic, that can sometimes cause some problems with folding. We normally like to see a pattern of hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids on a helix or on a sheet. However, I happen to know that for this particular structure, um, it has a very high alpha fold folding confidence. So we actually have a lot of confidence that this protein will fold up as designed, which is very nice. Uh, we know that alpha fold folding predictions and the alpha fold confidence very well reflects what we see when we test these in the wet lab. So um, the fact that AlphaFold gives this fold a high confidence uh, means that there's a good indication this will fold up as designed in the lab. Of course, it's still an outstanding question whether it would assemble in this tetramer shape. As always, we love to see what solutions you think are the most significant. So please share with scientists your favorite solutions, regardless of how they score on the folded leaderboards. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for playing, and we'll see you next time.